the Thoughty OT podcast. The other aspect is how language. So I was about 80% meaning deaf when I was young. So when I was in preschool, right. all I all I saw was fragmented pieces of information. All I heard was phonics. So these fragmented mm. things, I'm trying to give you a, an idea of how it felt. So sure. these fragmented yeah. things were making sound phonics to one another. So I didn't mm. create the association with the image and the sound to create word. What I was hearing yeah. was just pattern speak. What I was seeing yes. was visual patterns. Um, I was very hyperactive. Kind of like, like the swimming swimming. I like to say about the swimming swimming. Yeah, <laughs> like animal crossing. Like, yes, absolutely. You know, like the little animalese speak that they have. They go, rah, 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 rah. yeah, or like uh, <laughs> in, uh, for older viewers, and I used to watch <laughs> reruns of this. Peanuts, Charlie Brown, when when they yes. used to be in the. Um, the, the school he would do this trumpet sound it would be the adult yeah. speaking and it yeah would, yeah the, the sort of you never heard the adult the, the, the mm. which is it, 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 i always liked that they'd done that because it was purely about the kids and all their their uh, charlie brown was quite an endearing character he's a bit of a sulker a bit of a but he would always get there in the end he would he would always have his friends to back him up i like Kind sounds of, like me as a kid <laughs> well yeah i think it kind of sounds like me too maybe that's why we relate to it but nevertheless that is how i heard and saw this garnered quite serious attention from the head mistress who mm. was at the preschool quite worrying attention she thought the reason why i was acting and behaving the way i was was some sort of abuse. It was sort of subjectively kind of hinted at because she sure. wanted an appointment with my mum outside of the preschool. And my mum let her in. And she, the first thing she said was, oh, um, you've got a nice sitting room. And I said, what what, what do you think was meant by that? You know, what, what? and my mum's observation of that comment was it was a judgment she didn't expect yeah didn't she expect it to be yeah. yeah she was building up a framework of what this house would look like in connection with mm. how i was behaving or she sure. thought i was sure. behaving at preschool but going back to the language thing it kind of makes sense you know the the condition you would call it is you you hear it a lot in brain injury again you hear a lot of these words in brain injury, um, aphasia. And all aphasia is, is it affects the left hemisphere. And you've got different types. So I have a receptive and expressive one. And probably the one that was most prominent was anomia, anomia or anomia, mm. depending. Anomic aphasia is word finding. So as I got older and uh, my speech progressed, a lot of it was um, dysfunctional in the sense that if I couldn't hear the frequencies and sound patterns of what others were doing, that mm. would actually re echo back and actually have an impact on how I spoke. So it's sure. a feedback loop, isn't it? What I'm hearing mm. is going to represent to what I'm saying. I was echolalic for a longer period of time. So my language was more pattern, theme and feel rather than interpretive. The perfect example you gave was of the rattle. And also that's associative. So the rattle um, is, is, is a baby's rattle. Um, you're mm -hmm. making a visual association that it's a rattle and then you get its function. It's yes, interpretive yeah. function. We, well, we I, see things via function functionality. That's how like our brain interprets things as objects isn't it it's like yes you know what why do we see a chair as a chair and not like wheels with plastic coming off um and that, like a cushion yeah. and stuff like that it's because of its function right we sit on a chair that's right? it so it's so it's a chair that is just a whole thing like, yeah so now you can understand why i was context blind and meaning blind because all i saw i would either see a wheel or yeah. a cushion yes or a bit yeah. of wood that wouldn't be able to bring the gestalt together to make chair. Mm. Mm. And that was the same with people. 
So the language right. thing meant that you, I didn't get the feedback receptively or expressively. So the pattern, theme and feel language was language that was emotive based, but it was to do with my reality of, of the world. So it, right. it, was, it was perceived as nonsense speak by others, yeah. word salad. But it wasn't. It had a function. It had an internal function for me. Um, you know, uh, lots of um, lots of squealing. Um, the squealing, the high pitched squealing, would be happiness, and the sort of downturned, monotone grunts would be unhappiness. Um, lots sure. of cl- clicking for anxiety. So I would click. You know, like that. Chest thumping would be about dissociation and body disconnection. So thumping my chest. You're trying to trying to get back in your getting the feedback, the, uh, the somatosensory feedback in order to feel kind of yep. a bit more with you, it. Yeah, <laughs> you've got it. And sculpting things would be a partly a communicatory thing as well. Until in my head, I, um, I used to do that. If I like people, if I sense their energy and I like them and I wanted to be around them, I may oh. not have appeared like I wanted to be around them. I may have appeared quite aloof at times um but i did what that's i did want to connect but i didn't have the facial expressions or the um the clarity the visual clarity to connect in a way Mm. which maybe they expected now my parents were very good with this because how i recognized them was was one piece of information so my father i used to sculpt his face so i knew that face was father and with my yes. mother, who I've adopted her curly hair, um, I would I would feel her hair and I would know that was mother. So by extension, I was face blind as well. So I wasn't just sure. object blind or meaning blind. I was face blind. So you can kind of see how these things interplayed with one another. The visual perception mm. not only affected mm. my learning, my social perception, but context and association and language because I didn't have that bridge with pictures meant that my language, it kind of makes sense because that filter was a little bit like, like a bottleneck there. There there was a sort of bottleneck there. It made sense why my language was my own. It was very egocentric, I suppose, language. And even typically developing children um, will have egocentric language for a very long time. Um, I'm I'm quite surprised. You got to teach kids to like share toys and like, (laughs) Yes. Yeah, Yeah. you do. I remember um, going around a friend's house who had a little boy um, that still have it. It's not past tense. He's still with us. (laughs) Uh, He's about (laughs) seven now. And he was free. And this is uh, egocentric development fascinates me, particularly toddlers, because I like the way they think, probably because I sometimes think similarly and (laughs) yes and he's a love and it was really interesting why he got upset i could oddly relate to it sam the father said to jasper to be a good boy to be a good boy can you move those balloons now his reaction was actually really interesting so he started to well up and cry, which I really felt for him as his lip was quivering. And he said, he pointed at himself and he said in earnest, but I am a good boy. Yeah. And Sam didn't get it. So Sam said again, but to be a good boy, you, can you, can you move, can you move mm. those balloons? Mm. And he went again, he said, but I am a good boy. And I, I, I sort of thought, yeah, he, He's not making the link with the balloons and how that will somehow magically make him a good boy. Because actually, he's oddly right. I am a good boy. How do you become a good boy if you're not already a good boy? Exactly. And why would the balloons have any impact on me being a good boy? So actually, in an odd way, semantically, Mm. I thought, Mm. hmm, this is actually quite an interesting discourse the adults trying to say do this and jasper's reality is but why because i'm already that and it's i found that really just from a psychological Mm. and social point of view quite interesting that that'd be quite quite an interesting kind of point to 
guess like link in with like PDA, like the pathological yes. demand avoidance. It's like yeah. the expectations is what causes the the difficulty with demands on on you. Yes. Like if you don't do the demand, then you're you're not good, and that you get a punishment or like you know. You um, yeah, this is those kind of associations that you get when people are, tell you to do things. It's um, yes. But, um, I f I find it really interesting because I know that there's you know the majority of people who listen to this podcast they tend to be autistic. I think. Yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, I'm sure. Like I, I think looking at your Instagram, I think you're pretty much <laughs> on the money with that. Yes. Yeah. But I, I'm sure that there's going to be like a lot of people who aren't like parents, kind of wanting to see what. Um, autism is kind of like an adulthood and you know from from talking to you and hearing about your experiences with difficulties with visual things and and being non-verbal like your ability to describe and kind of i guess get give give a picture of what your world is like is is very very detailed and very very well kind of constructed which i suppose it it kind of goes in in some people's minds like against you know your early kind of childhood experiences in a way in 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 terms of like how well you you speak um yes. it's something that i experience a lot as well like you know how do, how do you do these things how do you like socialize how do you like empathize with people when you know you struggle with cognitive empathy you struggle with alexithymia you have communication yeah. difficulties social difficulties like why has this become something that you excel in? Like, is is was there any like drive for you to want to want to do that? Was it kind of an emptiness? Because for me, it was an emptiness of connection that kind of drew me to doing these kind of things. Yeah, that's very interesting. I I think the first person I made friends with was myself. I think that was it. Um, so when I was, go and I said this on the previous podcast, didn't I, about my, when I mm. was functionally nonverbal, my speech was more dysfunctional, I was going out into the community and I would attempt to connect. I would attempt with what language I had to try and connect with the older children. They were mm. somewhat older than me. Um, and their gaps in knowledge meant that there would be withdrawal or there would sure. I would be ignored or I would be um in, in it doesn't take a lot. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It just take it just takes like a, a slight delay in like the flow of conversation for people to kind of yeah. I, get I mean, awkward, look around, get distracted, like <laughs> Yeah, you're absolutely right. And then it got quite viscous, you know, it wasn't just ignoring, it was actually trying to wind me up or pushing mm. me, kicking me, hitting me, etc. But as I said in the previous podcast, mm. um, I'm, I've laid bare all that and I'm actually, I've internalised it to the point where I can talk about it, don't get affected by it, don't get triggered it's by it. Humanise them because they may have had developmental challenges. They could well have. They may have and had... kids. Yes. You know. Yeah. They have children. So a lot of them are married, you know, and do have children. So I had to kind of, you know, internalize that in a more structured and more balanced way. Um, I think the the void, it's an, it is a very powerful description, the void of connection. I suppose um, I started realizing I was different around 16, which I've been told is late. Maybe that's thankfully mm. so, because obviously I'd gone through a large chunk of puberty by that point. Still had a long way to go, but a large chunk of it had been had passed me by. So I think from that point of view, things didn't always hurt me as much because I didn't always understand the significance <laughs> of what they were saying. Yeah. I, was so, I was still meaning death. So... In some ways, the meaning deafness protected me from yeah. the complications of interpretation. 